We have gathered here together to grieve the death and celebrate the life of Joan Dudney Smart. We offer prayers of gratitude for her life, for we know that our lives have been blessed because of hers. The sages of old taught us to honor both life and death. For everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. Time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to cast away, a time to rip, and a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. On behalf of Joan Smart's daughter, Elizabeth, and son, Bill, I offer a warm welcome to you all. We are so glad that you could join us here in this unfamiliar way to most of us to celebrate Joan's life. If you would like to follow an order of service, the place on the website, firstuunash.org, that you entered this memorial service has a button that's, that shows the program. You just press that button and the program will come up. So you're invited to do so. Joan lived a matter for every time, lived a time for every matter under heaven. During her four score and just a few days short of 12 full turnings of the season. We know her as mother, aunt, mentor, friend. Joan was born in Java to a British actress and a very practical father from Tennessee. She was raised in Birmingham, England served in World War II as a member of the Army Motor Pool. And she told me Princess Elizabeth was there too. And when peacetime arrived, she traveled to Tennessee to meet her father's people. She married into that exotic culture and became one of you. I know some of you will speak eloquently of her many turning of the seasons here. So may this celebration of her life be a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to speak and a time to keep what we need to keep and speak of what we need to cast away. And at this time, I'd like to introduce to you Joan's favorite Episcopal priest who kindly responded to her request to speak a few words, the Reverend Battle Beasley. I'm going to be doing, going to be doing a reading from George. Joan had done a lot of reading and research about Julian. And I think one of the things that attracted her and they had in common was Julian was a mystic who called God mother, mother God, who nurtured us. 
So a reading from Julian of Norwich for Joan. And in this vision, he showed me a little thing the size of a hazelnut lying in the palm of my hand. And to my mind's eye, it was as round as any ball. I looked at it and thought, what can this be? And the answer came to me, it is all that is made. I wondered how it could last, for it was so small, I thought it might suddenly disappear. And my answer in my mind was, it lasts and will last forever because God loves it. Joan lasts and will last forever because God loves her. We have all known Joan at different moments of her life and in different ways. Each of these bits and pieces are part of a whole story that is round and complete as this nut. Now, I'm pretty sure this is not a hazelnut. I found that in uh, Nashville. If any of you want to put in the chat, which you'll see on the side of your screen, what kind of nut it is, that would be great. We all have bits and pieces of Joan's life. And only with a death can we put all those pieces together and start to really tell her story. So today, we're going to start gathering those pieces together and tell the story of Joan Smart's life. Her dear friend, Christine Walter, will begin. I'm Christine Walter. I'm an old friend of Joan's from way back in the 60s, and I'm a friend of the Smart family generally. Um, my time with Joan, my friendship with Joan, goes way back um, to the time when we first met at the Episcopal Church. Um, and a group of English women came together and we, for several years, had tea together, thoroughly enjoyed ourselves and had time off from the drudgery of, of family and got together probably once a month. And uh, unfortunately, we talked a lot about our experiences in America and some of the funny things that had happened to us, not unfortunately, but we, we enjoyed doing so. It was nice to be comfortable with our, um, with our English friends. Um, anyway, we, um, there were several years like that. Our children grew up together. Billy and Susan, my daughter, were good friends. And then um, Elizabeth and Robert were also our, our good friends as well. Um, Bob was always stoically around, um, making sure that everyone was doing what they were supposed to be doing. But um, Joan and I, I'm afraid, were kind of rebellious. We, we, we had a good time laughing at ourselves and, and others whom we loved. Um, this went on for several years as our children grew with scouts and church and school and all the things that they share, you know, with their friends. And then um, eventually Joan, once she got going on her studying, um, my family became something of guinea pigs. Um, we were in on all her testings and her speech and language development and all those things. She, when she had to do assignments, we, we worked with her with those. And then later on, when she became um, interested in psychology, we became her psychology experimenter ease and um, also enjoyed doing that with her and, and helping her through. Later on, Joan and I became uh, colleagues because she um, had a job that required an assistant and guess who she recruited? Me. So I helped her with a job that she had in Van Buren County and before I knew it, she had decided that I was going to be the teacher and she recruited me to go to college. Slowly but surely, she pushed me and shoved me and said, 
various things that talked me into starting having the courage really to um, start classes which I did and um, before very long I was on my way to a degree um, which pleased Joan immensely. She tended to lead me to it as far as my studies were concerned and our lives continued to parallel each other as the children grew and um, we still found time for tea and still had time to be there for each other through all the thick and thin of life's ups and downs as we um, plodded our individual courses towards our sort of airy fairy goals. Uh, but um, as I look back on our time together, I realized that Joan was both friend, sister, sometimes mother, and general mentor for me. Um, I became very, with her gentle touch, I became what I later found was a happy me with all, all my private life and my professional life being very much like hers in some ways, but, but she was mostly the intellectual of the two of us. I, I always had um, a bit of a, um, a sense of humor about who I'd become. Um, eventually, of course, they moved away to Nashville and um, when Bob retired, and then um, later, as, as things progressed, um, I visited her when she was in the nursing home. Um, I look back and I think when Bob, when Billy called me to tell me that Joan had died, my first reaction was relief, mostly. Um, she had not had the life that she she had had a life that she loved and enjoyed, but her life in the nursing home and on her own without friends around her was not what she considered a good life. And um, I was relieved that she had passed on. Uh, she will always be a very familiar name in our, my home. Uh, she will always be considered one of my very best friends. And I'll miss her terribly. I loved her. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christine. Next, I'd like to introduce David Lyle. Hello, I'm David Lyle in Nashville. I remember well the day I met Joan Smart in Mecklenburg, Tennessee. I was eight years old and it was 1969. My family had just moved to town. When I laid eyes on Joan, we were under a maple tree behind the Westwood Church of Christ at a Cub Scout troop meeting. The Smart Boys, Robert and Billy, were there. It must have been a family picnic meeting because all of our family on both sides were in the group. I imagine our sisters Elizabeth and Mary Carol Apologies. There seems to be some technical difficulties. I will restart that video. My apologies. Hello, I'm David Lyle in Nashville. I remember well the day I met Joan Smart in Mecklenburg, Tennessee. I was eight years old and it was 1969. My family had just moved to town. When I laid eyes on Joan, we were under a maple tree behind the Westwood Church of Christ at a Cub Scout troop meeting. The Smart Boys, Robert and Billy, were there. It must have been a family picnic meeting because all of our family on both sides were in the group. I imagine our sisters Elizabeth and Mary Carol were off in some covey in the corner with the preteens comparing notes on who the meanest teacher in fifth grade was. Anyway, I saw my mom, Mary Frances Lyle, standing at the base of the tree talking with a short, pleasant woman 
with a very interesting accent. And this is the God's honest truth. I swear they were talking about the need to make graduate education more accessible to women. Next to them was a tall, skinny gentleman who sounded really genteel, like what I imagined a Tennessee country lawyer ought to sound like. That was Joan and Bob, or as I would know them for the first 15 years of our friendship, Mr. and Mrs. Smart. Any of us who ever had even one chat with Joan knows she was quick-witted, funny, a gifted storyteller, and she always had an excellent book to recommend. My childhood memories include a string of conversations with Joan, and even better, chances to eavesdrop on her conversations with other grown-ups when the smarts came over to our house for a party. When the grown-ups were, were together, she taught me what really good conversation could be like. She never dominated when talking to others. But if she could see that you had the good sense to be interested, she always had a telling anecdote to prove her point. She would brilliantly craft her stories. In that era, they often featured some morally hapless education administrator who wanted to save some money by not treating the speech pathology of a hap failing third grader. She would shape the tale until she came to a sharp and usually very funny climax. When I grew up, it was a secret pleasure of mine to be admitted into that circle of people who could hear her stories without hiding behind a chair. Here's a story I want to share with you that I heard from Joan, and then I'll go. In the early 1990s, Bob and Joan lived just a couple of miles from my parents' house in Nashville. That gave me a perfect excuse to stop by occasionally. I could admire the beautiful, simple decor. Joan loved good craftsmanship. She had excellent Tennessee handicrafts throughout the house. I especially loved seeing the bold ge geometries and colors of paintings that hung on every wall by her late son, Robert. During these visits, I would sometimes tell Joan about my work with Integrity, the LGBT pressure group in the Episcopal Church. I remember that one time I stopped by to unload that I'd had the misfortune to attend a recent diocesan convention. I was dismayed at the new bishop's determination to promote anti-gay clergy and anti-lesbian clergy in the diocese. Joan told me, Oh, David, you needn't tell me anything more about that man. Do you know, I saw him last month at the Conference on Contemplative Prayer. During the tea break, I took the opportunity to remonstrate with him about the appalling mistreatment of gay people in the church. I asked him directly, Bishop, when will you consider the unhappiness the church's persecution causes our children? Do you know he couldn't be shamed? He said, Madam, I didn't become bishop just to make people feel good. Joan went on. I was astonished, but I straightened my back and said, Oh, bishop, I don't believe in just being nice all the time either. Neither Joan nor I ever had the slightest influence with that bishop and he did a lot of harm to people that we loved. But it was fun to have an ally like Joan at my side. Joan was a seeker of truth. She was a stalwart for justice and an advocate for respecting the dignity of every person. I loved her very much and I'll miss her. Good afternoon. I'm Bill Smart, Joan Smart's son. My first inclination when thinking about what to say about my mother was to tell her whole life story. Her upbringing during World War II, the struggles she went through as a child, the grit and drive it took to come to the United States, the challenges she experienced raising a family and the very unconventional way she moved through the world. 
There's enough material for an eight season series with 10 episodes each on Netflix. Easy. Okay, I tried to write all of that out for today, but I just, I couldn't do it. I couldn't squeeze it all into a few minutes. The truth is, when I think about my mother and our relationship, I feel incredibly fortunate. She's always been supportive of me in anything I decided to do. As long as I can remember, she was happy if I was happy. <clears throat> I was and still am obsessed with records and music. So if I wanted to hang out in my room and listen to records and I started at age four, that was fine by her. If at age five, I wanted to jump rope, and go over to Rachel Hoover's house and bake cakes in her easy bake oven, she thought that was great. The fact that I had no interest in sports didn't seem to bother her in the least. The main pressure I felt about that was at school, but coming home was a welcome oasis. I've heard so many stories of friends uh, when they were boys, they were brought up to feel badly because they didn't measure up to expectations of what they should be or being forced to struggle through little league, hating every second of it. And at the same time, creating a negative image of, image of themselves at a very, very early age. I'm so grateful that was not my experience. I think because she came from a completely different culture that she embraced and celebrated difference. I want to share something she wrote uh, as a holiday gift for my, my sister Elizabeth and I in 2009. This was just seven months after our father had died. Just to give you a sense of how outside the box she thought. She starts, some years ago, late 60s, early 70s, I was astonished to find that at times I was clairvoyant. I had never pursued psychic gifts because of my fears of mental illness, but I never denied them either. This was so neat. I would be meditating and suddenly these wonderful, almost three-dimensional pictures would pop into my visual field. They were moving and I could quite clearly see what was happening. In two instances, I saw what exactly was happening, I found out later. I just took it in my stride, didn't make a big deal of it, but thoroughly enjoyed it. After a few years, it went away. Since Bob died, several times I've noticed the clairvoyance coming back. No big deal. I just enjoyed it. This morning, as I lay in bed doing my breathing, I saw a picture of Bob, your dad. He was seated in the car, as I've often seen him getting ready to leave. I had observed how carefully he left. When I was going somewhere, I would just fling myself into the car, turn the key, and be off in a flash. Not Bob. He would take his time getting into the car, sit there for a few moments, as though he was getting comfortable. Finally, slowly turn the key, listen to the sound of the engine, and then take off. I suspect this is what he did when he was a bomber pilot, when the lives of his 11-man crew were in his hands. He told me that the takeoff was the most important and perilous moment of the whole mission. And so years later, he still took his time, even starting the car. This morning, as the picture filled my visual field, I knew Bob was leaving our apartment to go on with the next phase of his life. He was leaving and allowing me to see him go. I felt a deep, deep sense of peace that hasn't gone yet. And I hope I will always be able to evoke. Okay, All right. she was out there, right? But if it helped her process and move on with my father's death, then more power to her. 
This was obviously part of what drew her to extensive study and writing about Julian of Norwich, a Christian mystic who wrote about her visions back in the 14th century. I also love mom's enthusiasm by saying, this was so neat. The next piece I want to share is from a letter she wrote in 1985 that just gives a little window into her sense of humor. Bill, I was watching a program on Channel 8 from the Juilliard School in New York from the drama department. One of the faculty stated that an actor was his instrument, just as you have said your faculty person told you. The program went into some detail about student training. They use the Alexander method. It's a kind of body alignment relaxation training that helps the actor to project his emotions or message. I'm going to look it up at the MTSU library when I get the chance. At the Juilliard School, they take a before and after photo of the student in front of a grid and claim to be able to increase stature sometimes several inches. Of course, I've been able to do that for years, but in width not height. The last piece is from a letter she sent to me in September 1983. I'd just come out of the closet as a gay man to my parents just months before and had moved to Atlanta to go to art school. Dearest Bill, it's a great joy to me that you seem to have found what you really want to do. And even if you haven't, I know you have the courage to keep looking. She goes on to wrap up her letter by saying, I've always loved you and always will. Have a good life. Love, mother. What more could I ask for? What more do we really want in life but love, acceptance, and support? I have been so fortunate. Thank you. Hello, everybody. When my wonderful Uncle Bob brought her into the family, Joan Dundee became Aunt Joan to me. Still in high school then, I noticed that her eyes lit up when she talked to me, and I knew I'd like her. What didn't occur to me then was that since this handsome, charming uncle who dated half the beautiful women in Middle Tennessee had asked only her to marry him, there must be something very special about her. Figuring out what that was came later. Soon I began learning from her. She'd talk about interesting things, answer real questions with thoughtful answers. Once, after she'd given birth a few times, I asked her what that was like, and she answered with the wisest and most helpful one-liner anyone ever gave me on that subject. She said simply that it was a very powerful experience. That stuck. It gave me an orientation I could make good use of eventually. I loved her answer and grew to trust her even more after that. Later on, as my religious philosophical questions grew, she was actually curious about them, with no judgment or concern, just interest. And she'd share her own explorations if I asked. When I married a religious philosophical kind of guy, she heartily approved and wanted to know about his ideas too. At family gatherings, he and I would enjoy getting Aunt Joan off to ourselves to find out what she was into now. We were fellow travelers. Once when she and Uncle Bob visited us in the intentional community we'd moved into during its early, muddy, no sidewalks yet phase of development, Aunt Joan walked straight into our kitchen after dinner and said, where do these go? as she gingerly handed me the red clay encrusted shoes sitting by the sink waiting to be scraped off. And then she washed every single dish in a huge pile there while I got the children to bed. She could philosophize all day and night, 
she also attended to the physical plane with practicality as well as order and beauty and her own kind of elegance. She lived a certain balance that I still aspire to. She never ever preached it, just lived it. She did share with me that one does not put tea in plastic or metal teapots or cups. It affects the taste. Use only real china, she said, porcelain, well, or pottery if necessary. Probably she was right. Since then, I almost always use some kind of china for tea and think of her smiling. And of course, everyone who knew my Aunt Joan knows that vein of wry humor running just below the surface of everything she did. After Uncle Bob died, it seemed as if she allowed all the ungrieved grief from all the parts of her life to have its way with her. She had required of herself the immense courage it took to hold that grief mostly at bay for 80 years, fully aware that English propriety was the perfect cover for getting to live her life full tilt. She wasn't going to let an ocean of grief mess up that exceptional strategy. When Uncle Bob left, though, the children well launched on their paths. She found that rare courage to face all of the grief and let go of managing it, to just let it rip. Still, even then, almost drowning some days, it seemed, the humor lying dormant was still there. Once when I picked her up from a nursing center to go to church, we took an elevator with some well-meaning aides who worked there. One of them started talking to me about Aunt Joan, as if she weren't standing right there beside us, as people in our culture often speak of tiny children. I veered between feeling amazed that they couldn't see who she really was and trying to keep from bursting out laughing. When we got to the car, we didn't exactly giggle about it, but there were a few eye rolls involved. Her wry, sideways look at human behavior was still there underneath her tsunami of grief. Before then, in her 70s, she had joined me and two women half her age in a group to practice nonviolent communication. She took trips with me out of state to attend workshops on NBC, and in our small group, she shared some of the hurts she was working on healing, some of the habits she was trying to refine. She was still growing herself, still learning. And that's probably what was the most fun of all about her for me. As good as she was at keeping up appearances, if you knew her underneath, you knew that she never, ever bought those appearances as the true reality. You with all that perfectly well, of course, she might say, get on with the real job, figure out the energies underneath it all, do all that growing we came to do. So maybe life is too much of a mystery to ever solve, but one must try, of course. Shall we get on with it? And she did, of course. Don't you love that? I sure do. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm Mary Evans. I'm one of Aunt Joan's many nieces, as was my sister Joanna, um, who love her very, very much. My Aunt Joan married into our smart family when I was barely eight years old. And I remember the wedding. I remember being there. I remember being part of an important family occasion because my bachelor uncle was getting married. And now there were seven uncles and now seven aunts in my mother's family. So our family was complete and we were blessed to be that close-knit, happy, and complete family. That was until the first of our aunts passed away, my Aunt Fancher, a decade later. I was 18 at that time and a senior in high school when Aunt Fancher died. But all of that made so clear to me the heartbreaks along with the joys that are the richness of family life. Aunt Joan passed away at the beginning of this very week on Mother's Day. And now in our family, we only have one aunt still with us from that upper generation, our Aunt Martha Smart. Both Aunt Martha and Aunt Joan have had a really rough last couple of years. These have not been their optimal times, but these years were only a recent shift. Oh my word, we've 
really been so blessed with love and energy and creativity and tenderness and all the best things that cherished families have to offer. Bill and Elizabeth asked me as a niece if I'd share some memories of Aunt Joan today, and I'm really honored to do that. So thank you for letting me be live and, and with you all and look forward to greeting you at the reception later. Our Aunt Joan, with her British heritage and her globe-trotting upbringing, she was born in Indonesia, Lord have mercy, and her deep spirituality and questioning and her incredible creativity, um, they were just all gifts to us. The fact that her dad was a Tennessean and that she has this Tennessee family and Tennessee sister, um, hey, Rosemary, uh, were just complex, intriguing icing on the cake for us. Her explicit English culture and international background were part of the je ne sais quoi that drew our World War II pilot Uncle Bob to her. And her Tennessee ties just helped make her at home with us always. Each of my aunts and uncles is cherished by me and each for his or her own unique characteristic and gifts and the special love that we share just between ourselves as people. But my Aunt Joan was a corker, unique in every way. She was a searcher. Her spirit and creativity couldn't be contained. She was genuinely an irrepressible woman, way ahead of her time. And she kept life interesting and challenging on, on the cusp for Uncle Bob, really, all the days of their life, of their 52 married years. Motherhood and housekeeping and life on the farm in Smart Station were just a tiny piece of who she was. She was constantly bursting forth with her true self that maybe, given another era than the 1950s when she married, could well have manifested in so many other ways. And each of us has stories to tell of her, but here are just a few of mine. Aunt Joan made sure that her Britishness was front and center with us always. Tea was her passion, daily ritual. Her accent and vocabulary were erudite, proper. Um, they were a constant education to us all, and she never relinquished any of that over the years. She always made sure the bar was held high. We all received her glass jars of lemon curd every year for Christmas, and lemon curd became a smart farm family staple during the years when she was cooking. For Christmas dinner every year at Smart Farm, in addition to the turkey and ham and Aunt Martha's yeast rolls and Aunt Cornelia's stuffed celery, Aunt Joan made trifle, English trifle, uh, with its layers of sponge and cream custard and fruit. And there were various versions of it, as I remember, cherries in it some years. Um, the other aunt's contributions had been developed over the years and were already set in place. But as the last aunt to join the family, Aunt Joan had to clarify what her contributions would be at the holiday gatherings. And her sheer Englishness made clear that um, she would reiterate that and make that point. So trifle was what she helped us learn to eat. She also made sure that we read beyond the accepted standard USA educational system canon of what was British literature. So of course, in US schools, we all read Dickens and Thomas Hardy and William Makepeace Thackeray. So Aunt Joan sent us John Buchan, um, whom I'd never heard of nor ever read. My son, Joseph, got Buchan's Prester John and his 39 Steps and Green Mantle one year for a three book Take to read at camp set. Apparently, Aunt Joan told me she'd read Buck and novels as a child. And she loved them. And he was a guy who'd written during the Boer War and during World War I. And so she thought Joseph needed to broaden his repertoire, which I'm sure was completely true. When Aunt Joan and Uncle Bob returned to Tennessee to Smart Station for Uncle Bob's job at Arnold Engineering in Tullahoma and for their children to grow up in Tennessee and in Warren County, they together designed a new home on the farm that they built for their family. And it was an unheard of idea in our family, not a rehab, but this was a brand new house. I can only imagine the intra-family negotiations that must have gone on. And it was a wonderful house designed and built in the 1960s, spare and clean and European in its lines. And it had hidden cupboards. It was really just a perfect amalgam of the two of them. Um, antique pieces and Uncle Bob's woodworking and then Aunt Joan's need for order and space and light and beauty so that her her creativity could bloom. She'd gone to design school for a period of time when she was a young woman. She always had a wellspring of creativity. She journaled and she made art. Um, she wrote poetry. She had an absolutely beautiful hand for calligraphy. She wrote short stories and she shared them with us. She sent poems to all of us and to our children to mark special occasions. This particular little piece of calligraphy, you don't have time to read it, but it was something that she made for my son Joseph at his birth, just to show a little piece of her handiwork. 
This would what the time she would take to spend to give us a little gift of self on every occasion. Her own inner thought life and her appreciation for the expression of the artist's soul manifested in each of her children, in spades, I should say. All three of them, Elizabeth, Robert, and Bill, all pursued art and art degrees and worked for periods of time supporting themselves in artistic fields. She respected that and had immense support for their endeavors. Her various homes were art galleries of her children's work um, and, her, and her own work for that matter. And I hope each of you has been blessed with a piece of that uh, that has gotten dispersed about over the years. Theirs was really always a prolific family and their names may not have been household names at Sotheby's, but they surely were in the Smart family and we treasure having pieces of their work in our homes. Aunt Joan explicitly and with her energy and enthusiasm made that an intrinsic part of being a Smart. Of course, literature and music and wood and fabric and sewing and those sorts of handcrafts had always been parts of it, but Sculpture and now especially painting were especially smart in manifestation. She doggedly and unrelentingly pursued her own education and professional fulfillment. Her mind constantly strived to learn more. She wanted ever more, ever higher. Her intellect and curiosity were vessels that needed to be filled and replenished. Aunt Joan was most assuredly a seeker. And professionally, as others have mentioned, she became a speech and hear hearing specialist, a speech pathologist. She worked in Tennessee schools. And in addition to the degrees that she got in the 1940s in England, she got a degree at Vanderbilt. She taught at MTSU. She got an EDS at Tennessee Tech. She became a school psychologist in addition to being um, a language pathologist. She oversaw special education programs. She worked on her PhD in psychology and well, as well. And she was constantly refreshing and re-energizing and needing to acquire more information and knowledge. And she sought that for others as well. And she recognized that aspiration to be more in others as well. In her psychology training, she had so many skill sets and competencies. Remember when everybody was getting Myers-Briggs testing? Well, Aunt Joan was trained in that. And once I expressed to her that I was curious, where was I on that spectrum of introvert, extrovert, intuitive, sensate, thinking, feeling, judging, perceiving, that is Myers-Briggs. And I discussed this with my Aunt Joan and she said, well, she'd be happy to give me the test and do the calculation and determine my own Myers-Briggs personality type. So I remember where I was when I sat down to res respond to the pages of questions and I remember where I was in that time in my life. My children were little and I was being a scout leader right then. I helped out as a Boy Scout mom and I was a troop leader for our daughter's Girl Scout troop. So I turned in the questionnaire to Aunt Joan and she kept it and worked on it for a week or so. And then one day she called me and I remember really almost word for word what her response to me was. She said very emphatically, Mary, you are wasting away with the Boy Scouts. It is time for you to move on. Aunt Joan herself knew about moving on intellectually and professionally and personally because she did that continually over the years. One aspect of her life that she kept pursuing and developing always and was with her constantly was her spiritual life. She was reared in the Anglican church and she trained as a missionary and served in several Christian education capacities as a young professional. And as long as I can remember, as others have mentioned, she studied the teachings, wisdoms, writings, and revelations of the 14th century medieval anchorist, mystic, and holy recluse, Julian of Norwich. Julian, of course, was pre-Church of England by two centuries, so, so still within the Catholic Church domain. And Julian was an outspoken feminist, if you will, of her time. She wrote, Julian wrote, as verily as God is our father, so verily God is our mother. And it seems to me that Julian's wisdom was always esteemed, even in her own time. Um, she was not considered blasphemous and people pilgrimaged to learn from her. Even then, Aunt Joan herself went to Norwich on several occasions to immerse herself in Mother Julian. Aunt Joan kept a picture of Julian always hanging on the wall of their various homes. And she felt a great closeness and personal relationship to Julian. Julian wrote the beautiful, loving sweetness that is her Revelations of Divine Love, which is an ebook online, so you can pull it up and read it if you haven't ever. It's believed that before Julian took the life of a hermit, that she had been a wife and a mother, and that she had lost her entire family and all of her children to the Black Death. 
in the middle of the 1300s. And when Aunt Joan lost Robert in the 1980s, how all the more close she must have felt to Julian's spirit. Aunt Joan and Uncle Bob were a couple in love. I know they had trying times in their family as any marriage has, but they had a real genuine romantic passion for one another. It helped them traverse rough times and they were really unabashed about it. Aunt Joan called Uncle Bob darling all the years they were together. They enjoyed things together. They did things together. When they lived in Warren County, after the children were grown and out of the house, they experimented with this idea of what it might be like if they were to live in Nashville. So in a trial run of sorts, they rented a one bedroom apartment in Nashville. It was their little pied a terre in town to be able to drive into Nashville for a weekend, to dine out, meet up with friends, go to events. And an aspect of those weekends in town was for them dancing. Ballroom dancing, presumably. I like to imagine the sort of World War II era elegance of ballroom dancing. They were certainly members of a dance group or a dance club. And I had sort of heard of this. I'd heard it mentioned, but I don't think it had really carved a true um, memory track in my brain until one specific weekend when Gaius and I happened to be going to Nashville for some occasion and we needed to spend a night there. And Aunt Joan and Uncle Bob knew about it. So they gave us the key to their apartment. They said they weren't going to go into town on that particular weekend. They'd be pleased for us to take their place and, and stay their spot while we were in town. So we did. And I don't remember anything at all about that weekend or why we were there, but I surely remember turning the latch key into their in-town apartment, which of course was just beautifully appointed in lovely selected pieces they'd chosen to dress up their special getaway abode. And in their closet and in their chest of drawers, cause I was snooping, was a Hollywood wardrobe of evening gowns and crinolines and chiffon and netting and evening wraps and gold shoes and sequin shoes and above the elbow white leather gloves and in Uncle Bob's closet, his tucks and white tie and tails and cummerbunds and patent leather dancing shoes. <laughs> These were incredibly wonderful things. So they had this secret ballroom life and it was so dear. It was so lovely. It was so charming. So them on the farm, it was all tractor and plowing and skill saws and chainsaws, canning and baking and making and putting by. And then on the weekends in town, these <laughs> elegant soirees and tripping the light, fantastic and ballroom dancing and cocktails. I imagined who else would do that? but Aunt Joan and Uncle Bob surely did. And as I said, they were a couple in love who had true romance with one another. And in their later years, when I was well grown and we all lived near each other in Nashville and Uncle Bob had retired from engineering and he was in the middle of his later life career as a real estate broker, Aunt Joan would speak about that period of their lives, their retirement years as having been time for them to sort of relax and be together. And also time for their passions, their their well, their intimate relations. And I remember one occasion specifically, Aunt Joan and Uncle Bob and Bill and I were actually having lunch together. It was an outdoor restaurant somewhere in Nashville and Aunt Joan began telling about this particular personal topic. And Bill just started singing, la 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 and covering his ears and saying, no, 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 mom and dad. Too much information. I'm too young to be hearing this. Don't talk about that in front of me. Thank you very much. But I thought they were cute beyond words. When Uncle Bob passed away in 2009, and it's been 11 years now, Joanna referred to a lot of the times that she and Uncle, that she and Aunt Joan spent together um, with Aunt Joan growing. But there were many of us who felt that clearly making an adjustment to this new phase of their, her life this accommodation was being hard and maybe I'm wrong, but to me, despite her rich intellect and her many interests and her passion for learning and her spiritual life, which she attended to always, there was nevertheless a light that really had seemed to go out and it had a hard time being relit. And a decade's a really long time to have to experience so much loss and, and true sort of just emotional despair because they were really a magical couple. And in many ways, Aunt Joan 
um, was willing herself away, trying to stay current. But after Uncle Bob died, um, it was hard. So we tried to help. We tried to show up. We tried to be there. Um, but everybody was really a lousy, poor substitute. We were inadequate in the extreme. And plain and simple, her health began to deteriorate. When Julian of Norwich lost her husband and her children, it was during that great era of plague and death that swept across Europe in waves in the 1300s. Julian's taking the life of an, of an anchorite, that historic fact is now earning new assessment and visibility worldwide here in the spring of 2020 amid this coronavirus pandemic. Julian's self-isolation during contagion is making her life choice a very, very newly relevant to people who've never heard of her before. There was a recent BBC report on Julian that quoted, removing themselves from life would not only give anchorites a chance of preserving their own life, but also of finding calm and quiet and focus in a chaotic world. Aunt Joan had brought Julian's relevance to us as a family many, many decades ago that Julian's relationship to quarantine and pandemic and spiritual quest is now of renewed international focus, just as Aunt Joan has left us to become spirit with the others who've gone before, is hereby duly noted. Is that irony, serendipity, elegant intersection, perfect moment? I don't know, but the point's taken. We have loved you dearly, Aunt Joan. We have cherished you and appreciated you and admired you. And you've brought substance and depth and breadth to our family. We thank you for your many gifts of love and spirit and purpose and integrity and strength that you've given to all of us. And that these last years have been just awful for you. We really all hate that and wish it could have been otherwise. But in the words of your personal muse and your patron saint, Julian of Norwich, all shall be well, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Godspeed to our dearest Aunt Joan, and Godspeed and greetings to all of you. Julian, I tell them what I know. Ring out bells of Norwich and let the winter come and go. All shall be well again, I know. Love like the yellow daffodil is coming through the snow. Love like the yellow daffodil is lord of all I know. Ring out bells of Norwich and let the winter come shall be well again, I know. Ring for the yellow daffodil, the flower in the snow. Ring for the yellow daffodil and tell them what I know. Ring out bells of Norwich and let the winter come and go. All shall be well again, I Julian, I tell them what I know. Ring out bells of Norwich and let the winter come and go. All shall be well again, I know. All shall be well, I'm telling you, let the winter come and go. All shall be well again, I know. Oh, all shall be well again. I invite you to continue sharing your memories of Joan Smart's life during the reception, following the service, and in all our years 
to come. After the closing words, you will see a button on your screen that will connect you to a Zoom room. That is our reception. Or you can find the button on the church website at firstuunash.org. So in conclusion, I want to thank all of you for telling your stories about Joan today. By doing so, you brought Joan back to us as a perfectly whole, strong, round little thing, as full of life as that hickory nut. I was not alone, I found, in missing her dearly during her final spiritual journey of that many a wise elder has taken who turn their back on life and from us and towards death. Your stories remind me that she lives on in all of our stories and in our very lives. When any one of us lives life grounded, both in that practical, messy joy and despair of life so fully, and while bravely exploring the great mysteries of the spirit, both in love, then the seeds of Joan planted in her life keep sprouting. When we keep learning, seeking, and creating, no matter our age, then a bit of Joan keeps growing. When you reach out and teach and heal and mentor and challenge others, Joan's spirit keeps growing. When you stand ever so steadily for justice and advocate for the inherent worth and dignity of every human being, then you know that she still lives among us, as round and whole as those small nuts that grow into great trees and offer up more nuts again and again seeds of potential during their time, year after year. For there is a time to be born and a time to die. Today is a time to weep and clearly a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, probably a little ballroom. We mourn when we remember Joan's death and we laugh when we remember her life. The time to love her will not end, but the time to keep her has passed. So we will weep and laugh together, connected through her in love. Blessed be and amen. And the people come and go Here by the Tower of Julian I'll tell them what I know Ring out the bells of Norwich And let the winter come and go All shall be well again, I know Love like the yellow daffodil Is coming through the snow is Lord of all I know. Ring out the bells of Norwich and let the winter come and go. All shall be well again, I know. Ring for the yellow daffodil, the flower in the snow. Ring daffodil and tell them what I know. Ring out the bells of Norwich and let the winter come and go. All shall be well again, I know. Loud are the bells of Norwich and the
people come and go Here by the Tower of Julian I'll tell them what I know Ring out the bells of Norwich And let the winter come and go All shall be well again, I know All shall be well, I'm telling you Let the winter come and go All shall be well again, I know